Hey everybody, welcome back. Uh, nice to have you so many here. Nice to be back. I was actually just talking with Yari here and, and <laughs> I, I made notes and <laughs> listened to his lecture. Uh, but now it's it's time for the second part. Let's click on these that we get the slides working. So now I'm gonna kind of tell very similar stuff as just what just Yari said, but I'm gonna take, to put it kind of very bluntly, I'm gonna take my consultant hat on and just gonna cut corners and try to kind of bring the practicalities and, and make things much more simpler than they are, which is another way of saying as a disclaimer, things are much more complex that I'm gonna present, but I hope this simplicity will kind of shed light on things, on what the complexity is all about. So the key concept I'm going to introduce you now is this, uncertainty. And that is kind of the situation that a lot of organizations find themselves in. And typically the uh, story goes that it has been because of things such as these. Customers' expectations grow, need for speed for innovation. All of these things have changed so that organizations face this uncertainty and they don't know what to do. And in the middle of this uncertainty, there's a lot of solutions out there. Things are changing quite fast. You have different laws and regulations coming up. You have different technologies popping up. And then you have things like digitalization, which is causing even more uncertainties. Pretty much whatever organization you are in, even if you're a public sector organization or, or you're an international business. And if you look at these, I'm gonna go them quickly through soon. But if you look at all of these, I just popped here. I'm sure you are they all familiar to you. That when you talk to people and professionals, maybe you talk to your colleagues, that these are the things that you are kind of talking about that are causing uncertainty, causing the fog that you cannot necessarily see where this road is going. But now, of course, today there is this one big thing that is causing even more uncertainty. So if the previous slide was about organizational uncertainty in the past two decades, this is now the uncertainty we all live in, everybody on this planet. And actually, when I started thinking about the COVID-19 and the world we live in, and kind of crisis management or crisis leadership, I think the same basic principles are there behind, even if we're facing, let's say, digitalization, which is something that happens measured in years. But here, that's, that's what we all talk about nowadays. That's the reality we live in. There is this virus going on and there's these different kinds of uncertainties or factors around it, causing even more uncertainty in the future. Uh, but let's look at the uncertainty kind of take back. I'm going to have a few examples from what has happened now in this spring because of COVID-19. But let's look at kind of back at the bigger uncertainty that organizations have been tackling for one decade or two decades, depends how you count. One of the things is obviously that traditional management principles no longer work. And what I mean by this is that uh, actually somebody told me, I was talking with, uh, with the top management of, of a big Finnish corporation, and they said, Risto, you have to remember that most of our big bosses got their management schooling in the 1980s. So their principles are from the 1980s, which are pretty much, you know, if they were taught at school, then the principle is a little bit older than 1980s. And yes, the world has changed quite a lot since 1980s. And what if I can say about the management principles of them, um, kind of cutting corners here pretty fast, is that if you think that how organizations, especially businesses, have been managed in the past century, everything was really focusing on predictability. And to put it very simply, kind of predictability that we can predict what's going to happen in the next quarter, we can predict what's going to happen in the next year. And if you think of those organizations that you're on top of them, leading them, then what you're actually doing is you're optimizing the whole organization to give you predictability. And yes, in the past century, there were huge changes in the world as well but relatively certain kind of causalities. We know that if we do this, then our numbers and business numbers will look like this. If I do that, the market will probably behave like this and this. 
And that is the reason that why typically we got organizations that look like this. This is IBM from the 1930s, which you can see here, it has been kind of optimized as an organization that, you know, whoever's sitting on top of the pyramid can predict pretty easily what's going to happen in the future. And they can tell their board of directors, their shareholders, that this is what's going to happen. This is how we're going to work. And the world simply did not change as fast then. And that's why if we look at any organization that is decades old or, or even a century old, there is this huge history of having something like this as an organization. But then of course, one of the things that is happening Another thing is that new emerging technologies are popping up. And this is quite obvious. This is, of course, discussed in public newspapers. And, and most probably every one of you are excited about new technologies or maybe the business models behind them. But the fact is that these things are coming up so fast that we don't even have the time to figure out which of these is relevant so that we could study them maybe further. And one of the reasons it's then happening is this that the need for speed in innovation is increasing. And in the organization context, it is good to remember that innovation, the reason that innovation is kind of the front line of change when it comes to an organization. So if you think of an organization moving forward, then what is the thing that changes in the organization in the front line? Well, it is the products, it's the services, it is the business that the organization does. So if you're really fast in the front line, kind of coming up with innovation, then actually you are really fast to respond into these uncertainties. So if something happens and your innovation speed is really fast, then you can kind of quickly change the speed or the direction of the organization. At least that's the theory. That's the thinking. That's the idea behind when people say that we need more clock rate, better clock rate of innovation. We need faster innovation and all that. It is to build an organization that responds really fast. I put this example here. So here's a brewery, Brewdog uh, Brewery in Scotland that does beer. It's uh, very famous, at least here in the Nordics. And what happened during the COVID is that their speed of innovation was actually really fast. I think even within a week, they were able to start doing uh, hand sanitizer. So uncertainty, a very quick and rapid response and realizing that, hey, now there is a market for these. Or actually, I'm pretty sure they're not selling these, they're actually then giving them away. But then we have these things, legacy structures. If you're a software engineer, you know that legacy is kind of a curse word. Uh, so for example, if now there's a lot of discussion going on that have governments reacted fast enough to the COVID-19 crisis, or at least a lot of criticism that they have been too slow. Is this because they have certain structures that make them slower? So when we look at what is slowing down big organizations, there are of course many, many reasons. So typically you have things like these. Maybe the organization has physical assets. Maybe it has 20,000 kilometers of rails because it is a ra uh, train company. Uh, maybe the chain of command is a structure that is too slow to respond. Maybe it is the information technology. But some, you have to remember that these legacy structures can be really good as well. So if you think about laws and regulations, and typically they are there to slow down because you should not do things in a certain way. You should actually think you should have. And I think if you think about vaccination now in COVID-19, Yes, there's a lot of legacy structures to make sure that one, whenever they do the clinical trials for the vaccines, they are actually not worse than the disease, literally. So legacy structures, yes, they slow down, but they are not necessarily bad. And then one of the, uh, the final point about the uncertainty is that the one thing that is causing uncertainty is, of course, that customers' expectations change. They are not static. People who you are doing your things for, their mindset changes. So just like in Yari's things, you can take the same thing about markets and cultures and individuals. They are cultures, practices, attitudes, relational and everything. So my example here is this. So let's say you go to your corporate workplace here in the left and uh, you need to 
you know, punch in your travel costs into this ancient payroll system. And this might be your service experience at your workplace. And on the other hand, then maybe you go out and go some grocery shopping into a grocery store that has no checkout. You just walk in and grab the stuff and go out. So you can see there's a huge mismatch here that these people's expectations for how things work change very much because things are happening even outside whatever their business are in. So the big question in all of this, so there's this uncertainty, there is this fog, and literally as we speak, globally, there is this fog that we don't really know where we're going. There is a road, but we can't see further. And we can see from a business perspective, these black texts. So the question is, how do I lead? How do I organize my organization? big, small, medium size. So I put it simply, what to do? So is this all new under the sun? Is this the first time ever we as human beings have faced uncertainty? Of course not. The good news here, good folk, is that uh, handling strategic uncertainty is actually very well known and studied. I would say there's decades or even a century of research and academic and an experience of how do you actually lead in uncertainty. I'm not going to go through these. I have these in the reading material that we're going to give you after this lecture. Uh, but I give you a couple of articles. The first one is by Milliken from 1987, a great example of how you tackle uncertainty. Another one by Courtney et al. from 1997. Even from these years, you can see that this is old stuff, but this is good stuff. You can read these as if they were written yesterday. So the good news is there's a lot of things to look into. You can have research and you can study these things that how do you actually do strategic planning and how do you change your organization? But if we go back to today now, and when I say today, I'm not going to talk that much about the COVID crisis we live in, but maybe last, let's say, five years, maybe 10 years. Um, so there's a couple of corporate awakenings that I think that have happened that we can identify. And I think that one of the, the first things, I'm going to have two of these. But the first one is that organizations have kind of woken up that our own culture is key to the change. It's not enough that we change our people. It's not enough that we change our you know, HR structures. It's not enough that we do one thing. We need to do a bigger change. And then people talk about culture. Let's change our culture. And there's kind of a common consensus that the old culture we want to move away from looks something like this. Top-down control. It's like the IBM I had. A lot of processes, rigid structures, strong silos. And there in the middle where you see the smoke, there's a very strong, how should I put it, odor of Taylorism going on. And Taylorism, you have probably heard the word. And uh, it is after Frederick Winslow Taylor, roughly about 100 years ago, and his scientific principles applied to management, what he called scientific management. And we can still see in a lot of ways, a lot of the lenses, if I use what the other used, a lot of the lenses when we look at organizations, the first lenses that typically people put on are Taylor's lenses. And what he had, uh, based on was, of course, the scientific worldview about 100 years ago, that we can model, make a model the organization. We can make a model that describes the organization. And if you're a leader, then the leader is just like a rational observer who's looking at animals or looking at the uh, nature and has the brains and everything and see how things work. And then thirdly, that we can actually take this organization model it and then build and run it like a machine, like a mechanical structure with certain components and, and divisions and all of that. And that is really kind of the <laughs> distilled principles of scientific management. And then we get things like this. So in the left, I have the IBM, which is a very Tayloristic thing. You can see they have modeled the organization. They have different kind of functionalities, they have different competencies there in the hierarchy. And the leaders are there on the top, they're the rational ones that looking at these intelligent animals doing work and changing their behavior. Which is exactly the similar as the picture on the right, which is 
you know, some kind of a uh, ecological structure, a way of structuring the nature. You have the plants and you have the animals and everything. So it is this lens that is still very strong when we talk about organizations or when we think about organizations. And we have to realize that this is very old. This is two centuries old, something like that. Which means when we bring it to today, so if the legacy is that a lot of organizations in the past decades or a century have been thought that we can build an organization as a scientific machine, which means that we have a hierarchy, which is taxonomy of functions. We have bureaucracy, which is the causalities and rules of how our, our machine works. We have a top-down control because management is the rational observer. And then lastly, we see that management, running an organization is a natural science and we just need to find the correct theory and then everything becomes predictable. And then we get these. And at the same time in the past, at least a decade, we have these things popping up. And I think one of the good examples is the Agile Manifesto from Software Engineering, which is an organizational change coming from practitioners. And if you, I'm not gonna go through the manifesto and I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, but if you look at it, if you take Taylor's book and Agile Manifesto right next to each other, you can see that this is kind of an anti-Taylorism, this whole manifesto. Which is kind of my segue to my, my point being that we can all see that there is some kind of a, there is this new kind of company culture that we wanna go for. We wanna transform our company into this, this lean company culture, this agile company culture, which has these characteristics I have in this slide. So rather than defining what it is, but we can feel that there is this kind of, that everybody's looking into transforming this kind of new thing and accepting that we need to find our own path. Awakening number two, that if we wanna reach that new organization, it doesn't happen by PowerPoints. We need to do things. And this brings us back, of course, to 1970s and 1980s, Toyota and Lean and the birth of all of the lean culture of how do you actually remove waste and, and do all those things. And the person here who is important and often referred is John Shook. The story of John Shook was that he worked in the uh, automobile industry in the United States and he was sent to Japan to study that how is it possible that the Japanese make cars which are cheaper and better than American ones. And when John came back, he actually probably had heard Yaris lecture, <laughs> maybe not, this was 1980s, but pretty much similar things. So this is actually his model. Rather than, if you wanna change a culture, a company culture, you, the old model is you define the new culture, you define the values and the attitudes, and then you decide, tell people what to do. But what he learned from the Japanese car uh, factories, what, what if we start shaping what people do. And once they do things in a certain way, they can see the kind of inherent values and attitudes. And once if everybody shares these values and attitudes, that's how a new culture emerges. So it's not a top-down thing, the culture. It kind of grows from the grassroots. So to wrap it up, uncertainty, if you find yourself in uncertainty, your organization doesn't know what to do. The problem is you can't really plan it. The world is changing too fast. You can't really see behind the fog. So the typical knee reflex is that, hey, we must build a responsive culture, a culture that when changes happen, it responds automatically. Culture, what? What does a culture mean? It's a big word. It can mean many things. Well, we learn from John Shook that let's take the Culture means doing. So if people do things in a certain way, then the culture kind of emerges from there. So it's the focusing on actually doing things in a certain way. And what we learned from John Shook is that doing is very much routines and tools. So if you wanna make sure people do things the way you want, 
you provide them with certain tools and you teach them certain routines and then they start doing things collectively in a certain way. And that's what brings us to these fashionable words. So what are the routines and tools that are being introduced very strongly in organizations nowadays? Lean startup, design thinking, agile methodology, and so forth. Or to put it in another way, all of this. And if you have ever worked with any of these, or if you have read the books, just like Lean Startup, you understand it's not just the tools. The tools are not only tools, but the tools have inside them a certain mindset and a certain way of working. All those little things that, all those different lenses that Yari was talking about, these kind of implicitly include certain lenses and encourage certain behavior. To summarize, there's a kind of traditional D model. That's where we started from the upper left corner. We have uncertainty. What do we do? Let's build a responsive culture. Okay. What do you mean by that? Well, in this case, culture means that let's focus on how people do things. How do they do hands-on work? Okay. What does it mean? Let's start planning and designing the routines, tools, and practices of how people do things. And that's how we end up with things such as weeklies, canvases, retros, workshops, Kanban, Kanban boards, all of this stuff that I'm sure that you are familiar with. That's kind of the rationale why you are using them in your organization. And then we take the John Shook model and understand that if we get everybody to do weeklies, if we get everybody to use business model canvases, what it means that we're actually making them behave in certain things. There's tangibility in this fluffy culture stuff. And once everybody behaves in a certain way, it means that we can have shared thinking, shared values, shared meanings, collective experiences. Oh, yeah, 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 you're familiar with that canvas. Yeah, we use it as well. And once we have all these shared thinkings and meanings and values, maybe then we actually get this autonomous, responsive, and shared culture inside the organization. And when we get to the ultimate goal, which is that we remain competitive, in the middle of uncertainty. So that's really, that's really the, the, the gist of my point for this lecture. That's the angle. That's how we draw the line from uncertainty into these individual tools and how it goes back. And this I'm going to get back to this in the, in the other lectures as well. I'm an engineer. I like to make things very simple. So in all simplicity, this is from uncertainty to canvases. Why do we use canvases? Because we have uncertainty. What do you do in uncertainty? Use canvases. Okay. Now, if we had time and you were here, there might be a few questions, but let's leave them from later. So that was my lesson for today. I'm gonna to now give you the last exercise and then we're gonna pretty much wrap it up. Hmm. Exercise number one, big picture. Asking, drawing, understanding the big picture of another person. So the visualization is very simple. So let's take the arrow from my summary slide. We have, and if you remember what I had in that slide, you can see these different levels. There's this outside world, then there's our company, then it's our inside our company, how we organize. Then there's how do we actually work in teams. And then what does our individual team do? So you can see this kind of onion model that we can look at the world with different kind of contexts or different uh, focus areas of the onion. And what I'm saying as a facilitation teacher, what I'm here doing is that if you're working in uncertainty, then one of the key things, maybe the key thing is understanding the context where you work in. Understanding the context, the bigger picture where you're working. And that's what the first exercise is all about. Because whatever you're doing, there's always a larger context. So now, for example, think about your own current project that you're running or taking part of. That's what you do. Outside your individual doing there, you probably have a team. That's like the second layer of the onion. Your team is part of a bigger organization. And then the bigger organization is part of a whole company and the whole company is part of a certain market and so forth and so forth. And then you see this onion structure. 
And the important thing in this diagram, if you think about what is success. So think about, again, the job you're doing at the moment, individually, your job I'm doing. Who defines am I successful or not? Well, typically your, your own success is defined by the next layer, the team. Now, whether your team is successful is defined by the next layer, the organization. If your organization's, you know, the point is that your success is always defined outside your own bubble. And that's why if you want to be successful, you probably should understand all the bubbles involved. For example, uh, let's say I'm going to look at the time. Okay, I'm going to give you a quick example here. So let's say you are, you, you meet a UX designer in your company. You are a facilitator. And the designer tells you, oh, I really want to learn these new and agile and lean ways of working. Can you please teach me? And then you as a facilitator say, okay, I'll teach you, I'll coach you. Then the designer learns those skills. And then it's like, oh, now I know these skills. I know the philosophy, but no one in my team gets it. Then the next step, of course, is that the designer asks, can you coach the whole team? I believe in these thinking, I believe in these methods. Oh, I'll coach the whole team. Then you can see the next step. Ah, our team gets it. We're very agile, we're very responsive, but the organization isn't. Our boss doesn't get it. Our governor's model doesn't get it. Can you please teach our teams and our directors? Okay, I'll coach them all. Then you go and the PMO learn tools and teams and directors. And then you get the second layer. Uh, everything's fine, but our company strategy is totally not compatible with this new way. Our top executives don't get it. So the point being that even if you're that lonely person or you're coaching these people who want to do things differently, you need to help them understand the bigger, the next layers of the onion. And if you think you're as a facilitator, there's different names for you. If you're facilitating one person, maybe you call yourself a mentor. If you have a team, then maybe you're a coach. If you have the bigger organization, then maybe you call yourself a change agent. Well, if you're the whole leader of the big corporation, then you are a change leader. So definitely, if you look at these titles and what these kind of people are doing, then I would say it probably fits this very, very simple model as well. And once you clarify the context, once you start drawing those circles and that onion, you can get your money back if this doesn't happen. So once you have it clear, you can start suddenly, things become like magical. The success criteria becomes more visible. You can make your part part of the bigger whole. You engage others, especially the decision makers and so forth. And you get all these things once you just start understanding the larger context of where the work happens. And that is really what facilitation is all about, understanding the larger context. And that's what the first exercise is about. So you're going to get those of you who have assigned for the exercises, you're going to get a pair. Ono's going to send you an email. And you get the other person's email and then take it from there. So what I'm asking you to do when you get your pair, or even if you're not doing this exercise, you can do this at your work with your colleague. Ask them to tell what is their current project. What are they working on? And then start drawing the onion. Draw the first circle. Oh, this is you. This is what you are doing. So are you part of a larger team? Explain me. What is that team? What are your responsibilities? Oh, is that part of a larger? And is that part of a larger thing? And have the other person explain all those layers of the onion. And then you switch roles and do it the other way around. And see what happens. Because the magic is that you learn from the other person. But the other person who's explaining all of this to you, and they probably think that this is obvious for them, starts to realize that, well, actually, yeah, hmm, I never thought about it like this. A very effective, extremely simple exercise. And once you do it, I recommend reflect five to 10 minutes together about the exercise. What did you learn? How was it to facilitate? Did it work online? And so forth and so forth. And then you can return your drawings and your reflection bullet points to our email address that you see over there. Don't worry, you can ask. If this is not fully clear, then, then we will, of course, clarify it. 
And that email address over there, that should be working at the moment. So please ask all questions through that because then all of three of us can answer. Uh, Ona is gonna publish the, uh, we have a blog uh, under Alta University. And we're gonna put all the materials there, the links and the readings. So here's a couple of easy readings. There's a blog post I wrote about this uh, a couple of years ago when I was working with Bearing Point. Then those two articles I mentioned, have a look at them. Extremely good, very simple. And then you can go, ha ah, ha this is old stuff, but still very current. Somebody's asking for onion picture again. Uh, Do we have time? Yeah. I can show it. Let's see. Yeah, because to, second to last. So this is the onion picture pretty much. Or maybe this is the, uh, yeah. Individual team organization top executive. But once you start doing this, the point, once you start doing this for a real project, for a real person, it forces them to realize that what are the actual contexts they work in? Is there a bigger bubble? Is there not? I really like, for example, last year, somebody had, I have a diploma thesis, master's thesis. It doesn't work for me. And then after they started thinking about it, of course it does. <laughs> of course there's a bigger context. Of course there's a bigger context behind that context. So it's a really good exercise, believe me. Next week, I'm going to continue about organization transformation a little bit. And uh, we're getting close to the end. This is the last slide. A couple of good things here to remember. First of all, if you are doing credits for this course, now it's time to sign that I was here, I listened to the whole lecture. Do that. Second, uh, we're going to, there's the uh, link. Uh, I think we're going to send you an email tomorrow where, for all this material. Uh, definitely, we're going to give you the slides. The video recordings, I don't know yet. Uh, videos are a bit tricky. Uh, Ona will send you the emails about pairing. And then if you have any questions, you can email that. Or you can hang around. We're going to be here for a little bit. Well, we're not going to leave immediately. But hey, please, before you leave, woo nobody leave, nobody leave. Uh, we're going to give you a qu very quick poll. Just two questions for you to answer before you go. Uh, I'm going to launch it now, so please answer that. Uh, because we want to understand that breakout session we did. Should we have more of them? Was it working? Was it worth it? Can you see the potential? Or was it just, well, pff, nice experiment, but didn't work? And then, of course, just your overall feeling. This was the first lecture. This was just scratching the surface, and the next six lectures we're going to dip a little bit deeper into these topics. 